So thanks, Annie. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning. So I'm Jeremy Nobel, and as Annie mentioned, I am the, uh, the founder of the Unlonely Project, but I'm also a primary care physician, a public health practitioner, uh, and a poet. And in accepting kind of the invitation that uh, Dr. Murthy put out to bring our, um, our head and our hearts, I'll try to do both of those in the next uh, you know, 10 minutes or so where I'm going to share some, some of our work. But let me start with this general idea that creative expression can improve health and well-being. That really was the central principle for the foundation for the art, for, for art and healing that we started about 15 years ago. And it, and it seemed like such a radical kind of out-of-the-box thought at the time. And kind of it made me think of the quote by the uh, early 19th century philosopher Schopenhauer, who said, all truly new ideas go through three phases, ridicule, debate and acceptance. And having lived my professional life in ridicule, I'm delighted to be able to <laughs> share the art and healing activity with, with you. And uh, it, it's well past ridicule, as we can see by how full this auditorium is this morning. There is something about creative arts expression that is fundamental to who we are, puts us in touch with ourselves and others. And I think, uh, and that's what led us to start the Unlonely Project, is, is truly critical to finding a path forward towards the uh, connection with ourselves and others. And so uh, the Unlonely Project's been around two years. We've got three really uh, core goals. One is to increase awareness of the burden of loneliness and social isolation. And I, I think it's a trending topic, clearly, uh, even in the last six months. Major study released yesterday by Cigna showing burden of loneliness is uh, maybe 40, 45 percent, and not as, and maybe surprisingly, disproportionately <laughs> distributed, including uh, younger people feeling uh, quite, quite lonely. So, you know, clearly it's, it's growing in our attention. So awareness is helping. But then there's the other part, which is stigma, which we've already talked about. There's something about loneliness, and Dr. Murthy, I think, described some of the reasons for that, that, that makes us somehow feel that we're broken, we're not as whole, we're not as valuable as we would like to be or have other people see us as. And, and the, the, the reason stigma is so important is to the extent we try to put programming out there, which is the third thing we do, if people feel reluctant to step outside of their own negative emotions of guilt and shame, their engagement with that programming will not be as effective as it could be. So that, that's the Unlonely Project. And we, we do a lot of our work through partnerships. We partner with groups that really have footprint in the community and passion and commitment. So everything from AARP, the VA, colleges. But you know, thinking about partnership and thinking about National Academy of, of uh, Medicine, delighted to be here and really kind of have an opportunity to be partnering with all the individuals and organizations in the audience today. So let's jump in. So why do humans make art? I think this actually is part of what got my attention about the opportunity here. And could it be that the arts enhance survival? There's no culture that, where the arts aren't important, you know, in the history of recorded time right, without music or dance or language, and so they must be doing something important for our psyche, and so what could that be? I think one of the things the arts really invite us to do is to pay careful attention, even at a time of continuous partial attention, which is what the modern age is, and then with that attention, start making sense of the world. So I think that's one of the reasons why the arts have been around for a long time, and they also uh, allow us to build durable connection um, through the sharing of kind of our observations, and that increases resilience. And if there's any doubt about whether we're hard or soft wired to be connected, uh, and you think about evolutionary biology just as a simple explanation, and obviously this is hand-waving, but you know, imagine it's 70,000 years ago and you hear a rustling in the bushes, and you think, gee, maybe it's a saber-toothed tiger, and you pick up a stick. Wouldn't, to defend yourself and survive, wouldn't you feel better if there were 10 people around you also picking up sticks? <laughs> and the answer is, of course. And so one extension is maybe that kind of important physiologic cascade, fight or flight, is always turned up a little bit if you actually feel like no one's got your back. There's no one picking up sticks around you to help defend you from whatever threat you have. And so maybe it's no surprise as good epidemiology is coming out on the toxicity of loneliness, that it increases risk of early mortality by 30 percent, 
We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, that actually it's because that we are hardwired for connection and when we don't have those connections, um, other things happen. So what, what does this have to do with clinical uh, burnout? So what, what is clinical burnout? And I, I'm well aware that, you know, that there are experts and, uh, and scholars of it in the audience. So you know, at its core, a sense of futility, and then with that, isolation, exhaustion, being overwhelmed, and some questions like, does what I do matter, and will I succeed at it? And clearly, a sense of acceleration, too much, too fast, leading to some exhaustion. And then, you know, how about, how am I? Am I any good at doing these things I work so hard to do, particularly, you know, as pressures build up and so on, and, and leading to a sense of inadequacy? So again, we're not going to um, uh, dig right into it, but just to point out, it's not a new concern. So um, this is actually me as a third year resident. <laughs> <laughs> I sent it around to, to some people I work with at, at the Center for Primary Care at Harvard, and I said, doesn't it make you nostalgic? And they said, yeah, it makes me nostalgic for when I had more hair. <laughs> but, you know, I, I express my isolation and burnout in lots of ways. This gesture was one of them. Uh, <laughs> but also, I was really almost undone personally by the experience. My rela personal relationships fell apart. I actually, this was before the days of smartphones, obviously. I had landlines. I went home and unplugged my phone. I couldn't tolerate just the idea of just being, you know, kind of overwhelmed by more um, input, really. And so I withdrew. Fortunately, I did. I, I had played around with poetry in college and even in medical school, and I found my way back to it in a way that I can just share unashamedly. Saved my life. And I think poetry can do that. I think the arts can do that. And um, and I think kind of. I'm delighted to be part of this exploration of it today. And, you know, so, but why? And again, I know there are experts on uh, clinical burnout. W what's going on? And I'm, I wanted to draw your attention. You know, there are a lot of things going on leading to burnout, right? The actual um, load of medical knowledge, the complexity of sorting it out is, it just feels limitless. And I'm going to draw your attention to what's in the parentheses around this, because that's, those are the emotional burdens. Patient care, urgent, vital, that's why we do what we do, but the demands just feel uh, boundless. And then system management, and I do a lot in systems, you know, kind of system coordination, you know, the all, you know, all the Don Berwick stuff, who I worked with early in my career and, and whose work I admire, and yet um, many times the systems are confusing and irrational when we have to participate in them, feeling a growing sense, an accelerating sense of frustration. So think about the emotional aspect of all of this and the, and the struggle to connect as we're going through this activity. So back to the physiologic burden, f flight or fight, fight, you know, growing awareness that it's not just a mental health issue to feel overwhelmed, isolated, and lonely. It's toxic. Smoking 15 cigarettes a day, that's what Julianne Holt Lundstedt's epidemiology Brigham Young University is pointing towards. So here's the intriguing possibility. What can the arts do to connect us? So um, Tony Kushner, um, Angels in America, it's come back to Broadway, I think, because of the timeliness. I love this quote. I think that people do go to art in general as a way of addressing very deep, very intimate, very mercurial and elusive, ineffable things in a communal setting. It ends a certain kind of inner loneliness or it joins one own, one's own inner loneliness with the inner loneliness of many other people. A theme we've already heard quite a bit this morning. And I think that can be healing, and we agree. On the system side, many of you probably know um, Harlan. He's worked with us on various aspects. And, and I love his synthesis of humanism and systems thinking. If we can demonstrate that emotion affects outcomes, and we know that through multiple studies, particularly cardiovascular health, that there are toxic emotions, increased risk for second heart attack, and so on, and art affects emotion, then a logical path to better outcomes would involve more attention to engaging people in artistic pursuits. And that's part of what's kind of spurred us forward um, in the Unlonely Project. And again, we'll, you know, this has been, um, you know, this is really in the art we'll be sharing with the panel and then at the reception tonight, you'll see this, the making of art, the sharing of art, and the receiving of art. Each individually brings a sense of connection with yourself and others, and then brought together as a system, as we are, will be doing in, in like two minutes in the sharing of art, changes how we're connected to ourselves and others. And these, these three key components 
are really at the basis of, the, of what the Unlonely Project offers. So in sum, what can, what can the arts offer? A powerful, fun, don't forget fun, uh, and non-threatening way to, to engage people so they can um, put, put in, be in touch with their emotions and share them, a way to connect people with themselves and others, and as we've already heard, uh, address that critical need to promote a sense of well-being. So in closing, you know, it is a fragile world for ourselves and for many of the people we care about, whether they're colleagues, loved ones, or patients. Uh, I think there are opportunities to use creative arts expression when someone says, well, what do we do? Uh, let's start maybe by not being um, afraid of loneliness. Let's be willing to talk about it. Let's be willing to um, explore it, be curious about it. And I think the arts offer an unbelievable power, unbelievably powerful way to do that. So let me close the introductory remarks and really turn to our remarkable panel of artists who are here to make us more connected by sharing their work with creative expression. So thank you. Thank you.